Hello, welcome and good evening. My name is Denise Barbosa and we are here once again live from McKinsey Studio in Sao Paulo. McKinsey Talks was conceived as a space for conversations with leading experts from both within and outside McKinsey on the topics that are top of mind for Latin American executives. Today's session will focus on how effective engagement with startups can create value for corporates in the long term. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Brian Walsh. Brian is the head of Wind Ventures, the strategic venture capital group of COPAC, a leading energy company in Latin America and the US. Wind Ventures provides mobility, energy, and retail startups and scale-ups with unfair access to Latin America as well as capital. Brian has over two decades of venture capital and startup experience. He has led venturing efforts for corporations, including Konica Minolta out of Silicon Valley as a management consultant at McKinsey and today for CAPAC. Brian holds a bachelor's of science in physics and an MBA from MIT's Long. Hi, Brian, welcome. Hi, good evening. Hello. Good evening. And Sidham Ramtre, an associate partner at McKinsey in Sao Paulo. Actually, he is the one in our studio in Sao Paulo. I'm remote, but he's there. Sid leads the innovation service line of the strategy and corporate finance practice in Latin America and works for with both corporates and startups across multiple sectors on growth strategy, among other topics. Hello, Sid. Hello, everybody. As a reminder, I can, you at home, you can send your questions over the course of the session by using the field on the right of the screen or at the bottom if you are using your cell phone. Please send as many questions as you can. Your contributions are vital to us having a robust and productive conversation. Let's get going, shall we? See, the floor is yours. Thank you, Denise. Hello, everybody. Uh, prior to turning uh, on to Q&A with Brian, I'd like to go ahead and briefly present our own view as McKinsey on corporate startup engagement and how we believe that can create value. So kicking us off, really, why exactly do corporations need to engage with startups? The simple answer is the fact that there is no sector in this world at this point in time that is not being disrupted by technology and startups that happen to be at the forefront of that technology. Every incumbent corporation is facing some threat or another on account of startups, and there is a need to go ahead and engage, observe, learn, at times even absorb as much as possible. So from a strategic perspective, we do believe that engaging with startups does bring better market intelligence, better learning. It can inspire better ideation with respect to the kinds of new businesses corporations themselves would want to build as they think about their innovation journeys going forward. It can also be thought of as a bit of a protective hedge, lest you go ahead and ignore the startup that seems small today that happens to become your largest and most significant competitor tomorrow. If you could go ahead and acquire them by way of example, you are in some effect being able to neutralize competition uh, way sooner than it becomes a threat. Lastly, companies want to come across as being perceived by everyone else as cutting edge. You observe startups, you learn from them, you imbibe their best practices, you do get to sort of improve your reputation, do get to learn, do get to grow. These are all strategic benefits. I would also add that while it is not a primary consideration, corporations that invest in startups are at times able to also go ahead and see financial returns. And the primary reason for that is that in capital markets, even in private markets, digital first businesses do happen to actually have higher multiples and command higher valuations than traditional businesses. So there is a bit of a financial halo effect as well. Let's tackle one second topic. How is it that you can go ahead and drive this kind of external innovation, this engagement with startups? There are multiple models that I'll go ahead and talk through right now. Uh, let me first go ahead and focus on what's referred to as a studio model. That is one in which you actually go ahead and gain inspiration from ideas on the outside, from startups, for the purposes of really building your own businesses. So you really take the kernel of the idea, but you go ahead and run with it internally. You can also choose to have an accelerator program, which is essentially a mentorship program where you provide access to physical space, to resources, at times even funding with equity in return, 
in order to actually go ahead and nurture a startup into a higher space of maturity. The third option would be to go ahead and assemble a fund, a corporate venture capital model, where you're able to go ahead and yourself programmatically build up a portfolio of startups uh, that you will go ahead and guide to exit and success. And on the last end of the spectrum, you can think about an inorganic move in the form of a joint venture, a partnership model. And lastly, M&A, uh, which means that you would go ahead and own 100% of the company and eventually choose to even integrate it into your operations if you find that worthwhile. So as you can see, there's a range of models across which I'd like to go ahead and now kick off my conversation with Brian. Brian, hello, and thanks again for your time. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Brilliant. Kicking us off, actually, as I reflect on this page, sort of showcasing the different innovation models, one question we get from clients is about whether there is a single silver bullet or is it about mixing and matching models to your needs? How do you as a practitioner in the space think about that? Uh, well, I don't think there's a one size fits all. So the silver bullet metaphor, I, I think, is um, something to be avoided. Uh, if you if you look at the spectrum, you'll see there's actually quite a bit different requirements to doing them well. There's some that are quite lean and thin, while some of these models require pools of capital to invest, for example. Uh, and so for a corporate to decide, hey, I want to start engaging startups, but which model should I focus on first? I think the clarity comes from clearly articulating what the objective is. Right. So if you're just by way of one example, if you're a corporate in a sector that business as usual is performing well, right, there's no immediate change or rate of change. Uh, but you are starting to see uh, digital uh, uh, attackers, if you will, or, or startups focusing on different elements of your market. You may say, hey, we don't need to start investing. We don't need to start acquiring, but perhaps we should get a better handle on what they are doing. Um, uh, as it's relevant to our customer. So a very lean outpost, a very lean scouting program uh, could be the right model for that objective. On the converse side, if you're in an industry that has a rapid rate of change, and there's a lot of them from FinTech or financial services to energy to retail to mobility, this is where you say, listen, we need to do more than just learn what they're doing. We need to collaborate. We need to bring something to the table. And that's where you need the deeper models of engagement, the more difficult models, honestly. Uh, but that's where you need uh, corporate venture capital, the acquisition, the JV and the partnership ones, right? So really the clarity comes from first deciding what are your objectives for doing this? And then number two, you can then decide across the spectrum, you know, which are the models to focus in and, and, to, fo and to, uh, to give some attention. now. On multiple models, uh, this can happen um, in, in two ways I see it. One, uh, if there are startup engagement or capabilities that stem from the business units themselves and you have multiple business units, at the end of the day, you can have multiple engagement uh, or programs uh, across the enterprise. So that's one. But at the corporate level, at the central level, you know, typically you would start with one, but then you know, one, two, three years into it, you may then start to ask, hey, this is going reasonably well. How can we make it even better? And that's where you may say, hey, we're doing corporate venture capital as an example. Perhaps we now do an accelerator uh, focused on earlier stage startups to then you know, populate the, the top of the funnel, so to speak, for the CVC. So there's a nice synergy there. Uh, and, and then in that way, you do, you know, you go to two models and then you do three and four, et cetera. Got it. Excellent. I guess regardless of whichever combination of models you take on, right, there is a natural culture clash. How do you encourage corporations to really make a mindset shift to start to think a bit more like startups? Yeah, this is this is probably the biggest point of friction of, of any of these. Um, you know, just to tee this up a little bit, corporates, you know, as as you know, Sid, but uh, for the audience, corporates, I would describe them as bureaucratic, process-driven, and cost-optimized, right? And that's in stark contrast to what an agile, very lean, very flat, future-forward uh, looking startup is. And so, you know, it's almost like oil and water. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just as one example, even a name change, this has happened to me a number of times in my career, a name change of a startup that's engaging with the corporate can cause so much confusion 
uh, given that there's so many agreements and so many different siloed uh, parts of the organizations that's working with it, and they get confused, is this a new startup or what happened to it? But startups, frankly, change their name all the time. Uh, and so I think it's not to shift the mindset entirely from corporate to venture. Uh, to me, I think what's required is to insert a familiarity of the venture mindset. It's an educational thing. Uh, and, and so the groups that are engaging with startups just fundamentally need to know how are startups different? What is the milestone-based company building process that they go through? What is their risk of failure? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, in the, you can either learn that the hard way, like the example that I gave, or there can be sort of proactive leadership educational element with the leaders of the external innovation group uh, to do this so that eyes are wide open. And so it's not such a shock when something like this happens that's unfamiliar, uh, but it's it's almost expected and uh, the corporate mindset or the corporate people that um, engage are ready uh, to help. Got it, excellent. I guess deep diving into the models, right? And I'm looking at the one on the right-hand side, which is most resource intensive, M&A, right? And I'm also thinking about the typical funnel that runs from target searching to transaction execution and then integration after. How should a corporate go about the process of trying to systematically prospect a space for startups? And how does that search typically differ from what corporates are very used to and do well, uh, which is actual sort of conventional target searching, right? Traditional m and Yeah, I think there's, I mean, to me, there's, there's two archetypes here. Um, and it, and it's, it's dependent upon the target itself. Um, and so I'd say in number one, if the target is familiar to the corporate, meaning that the customer base, the business model, the tech stack, the talent and the knowledge, it's all somehow very familiar to the corporate, then I think a traditional M&A process is fine. You know, one where there's a thesis, there's a scouting, they find the target and they make a large big move. That can, you know, for a startup where everything is familiar, I think that's appropriate. But in most cases, there's a lot of unfamiliar, unfamiliarity. And so in this case, I think you have to be mindful that you don't know everything to make a really uh, smart M&A uh, acquisition. And since these are sort of you know, big moves as we call them, you want to be careful. And so there is one mitigation approach that I've seen work really well. And most of the big tech uh, companies do this quite well. Uh, is that they say, listen, we want to we want to move into this new strategic area. We there are things that we do not understand well, uh, and so before we make that sort of cornerstone acquisition, let's build out a venture portfolio in that space, right? And so using Cisco as an example, uh, they wanted to get big into uh, the Internet of Things. They recognized there's a lot of things they did not know, and so they built out a portfolio of ten or so startups learned a lot about what the tech stack needed to be, what the talent needed to be, what the go-to-market needed to be, what customers liked and didn't like, and they leveraged all that insight to ultimately make that cornerstone acquisition. Uh, and it, actually, the acquisition was not part of their portfolio, but you know sometimes it is. But that's the way, you know, you've got to be careful about what is unfamiliar and making big moves, either ignoring the what is unfamiliar or um, not trying to mitigate them. Got it. I guess this leads me to the next natural question, right? Okay, great. So I found my target. How does the due diligence process work? What are the markers for a good company? And again, how is that different from the traditional due diligence process? Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, th there's different approaches to this, but, uh, you know, I think there's certain, you know, I think uh, you've got, a, you've, you've laid it out reasonably well here. I think, you know, that commercial bucket that you have here, there's a lot to that bucket, right? When you're dealing with startups. And the approach as I describe it is, hey, let's list out all of the dis different risk buckets there are, and then let's get our heads around each one of those. And so within commercial, you'll typically have market risk. You'll certainly have the team risk. You'll have, you know, you know, uh, willingness to pay risk, regulatory risk, scaling risk. You'll have, uh, you know, funding risk. How much capital will it require to ultimately achieve profitability? Uh, and then you've got to address the tech risk, right? Um, you know, do, is the technology scaled to the point, uh, or can it be scaled, or what are what are the real failure points uh, with the technology itself? 
And so those are the two, whether it's M&A or uh, an investment, frankly, those are the two that you want to uh, focus on first. If you get comfort there, um, then you know, you're sort of gearing in for the acquisition or for the investment. And that's where you bring in uh, the consults typically or the, or the external advisors to do the, the tax, the auditing, and, and then ultimately the legal. Uh, but it tends to be the sequence of how it happens. Got it. Excellent. And, and Sid, uh, does what you look for in a due diligence process change based on the maturity level of the startup? It does, actually. And, and, and let me lay out why, right? I mean, quite simply, if you think about a company that has just been founded or a company that's only raised one round of funding, Series A, versus a company that you know has raised multiple rounds, think Series B, C, D, E, and nowadays the spectrum goes on and on, uh, there's a natural difference in the level of maturity, the level of information available, how far that company has actually been able to take its business model. So the, in, in some respects, early stage diligences do really sort of work on what I would refer to as being a slightly more instinctive gut feel on certain elements. Yes, you have the opportunity to actually go ahead and assess the pain point that the startup is trying to solve. You can even have an indication with respect to the total addressable market that they absolutely aspire to go ahead and attack, right? So you can go ahead and understand the attractiveness of the market. But I think a lot of other elements really come down to softer assessments, right? What is the fit of the founder, right, with respect to the market? Why is it that this particular team actually has the ability to succeed? What's their track record by way of example, right? You also need to go ahead and try and gain a sense qualitatively about the uniqueness of the value proposition. If they have gone ahead and put out a test balloon out in the market, what does the early reaction to that have been? And you also need to recognize at the same time when you make these investments that there is a high level of inherent risk involved, given the fact that you know, there is going to take a long time for this particular startup to gain in maturity and capability. Now, if you start to look later stage, you know, in some respects, the risks don't go down, but there are more knowns right, that you can start to work with and you have greater richness of information in many respects, right? That is where you can actually go ahead and see, um, let us say, a demonstrated product market fit. You can start to go ahead and understand uh, customer reactions more effectively. Uh, you also have leadership excitement, right? You start to basically link what that startup is able to achieve with what is it that you actually think you'd want to do as a corporate with it in terms of partnership potential. So that's really how we think about this, Denise. Uh, in terms of maturity differences. Okay, got it. Thank you. Brilliant. Let me actually take that opportunity to perhaps uh, you know throw another question at Brian. Right? We spoke so much about how corporates can benefit from startups. Let's turn it the other way around. Right? Uh, how can corporates help startups? Like, where is the value add over there that startups should aspire to have? Yeah, this is uh, quite dear to my heart. Um, yeah, it's, it's such an important element to corporates engaging the startup ecosystem. You know, there's so much capital out there today that, you know, really what corporates need to think about is a distinctive, compelling, and real value proposition beyond capital. Um, and, uh, you know, distinctive meaning that, you know, it can't just be to help. It, you know, it's gotta, it can't be general in that sense. It's really got to say, hey, this is who we are. These are the unique assets or the unique capabilities that we bring to the ecosystem. And so we're going to focus on that to make it stand out. Um, and obviously compelling, uh, you know, we've got to twist that so it's compelling, but then real. Uh, and so, you know, these are some good examples of, you know, expertise, you know, anchor customer, you know, scaling, scaling partner reputation. But I think beyond that, after you get, that distinctive, compelling, and real, uh, or distinctive and compelling value proposition, be it some of these that McKinsey has listed or, or others, the real thing is really important, right? And so you've got to ask yourself, so we're going to promise this to these startups and this ecosystem, but how will that actually work? What are the processes? What are the people? What are the capabilities behind actually making that real, right? How do we make, how do we actually engage with startups in a startup friendly way uh, to deliver this, because it will be it will be quickly discovered if you're throwing out there a value proposition, but then it's terribly difficult for the first couple of startups to ever realize that. Right? You know, these ecosystems are quite small, and so that's a reputational risk. So, not only figuring this out, Sid, but 
actually figuring out how to deliver it uh, is really key. Got it. Thank you. I want to now turn our attention to the corporate venture capital model, right? One step down in the intensity level, uh, but equally relevant in terms of the kind of activity we're seeing across Brazil as well as Spanish-speaking Latin America. You know, I myself in my time doing this have had a lot of executives come up and say, you know, venture capital as an asset class makes me very nervous. These valuations are too high. You know, I don't really understand it. What's going to happen if I put $2 million in a company and heaven forbid the company goes down under, right? How do you react to that kind of a critique against the venture capital model? Uh, well, I, my reaction right now is that it's not necessarily a critique. It's, it's being honest about what happens, right? And so I think the question then becomes, how do you do that well? I mean, just how do you do that well, given investments where you expect two thirds of the investments to go to zero? You, you know, there's no return. Uh, and so for that, there has to be a really keen understanding of the venture capital model, you know, from which corporate venture capital is, is you know, sits on top of. Uh, and so to do this, you know, it's part education of, hey, there's a portfolio you have to build. Diversification is the way to mitigate the risk that you have uh, that you have identified. Um, but to do it really well requires specialized talent. Right? There, there are people out there that have been doing venture capital, private or in corporate, for ten plus years. And frankly, you don't learn how to do it in business school. You don't learn how to do it in college. Um, you learn. About, it's an apprenticeship type model. Um, it quite literally, you know, the, the eldest or the oldest, the most senior people of any venture partnership uh, are commonly referred to as the tribal elders, right? And the tribal elders are meant to teach and mentor and bring up the younger talent. Uh, and so, you know, to do this well, you've got to capture some of that talent, um, you know, someone who can then mentor and start building the program that you want, but also can educate why do startups fail how do you mitigate the risk? Ultimately, how do we get the strategic value out of this capability? Um, and so that's that's my reaction. That it's, it's not to mask the realities of what happens. Startups do fail, um, but it is there is a very clear um, way uh, in doing it well. Uh, but it has certain requirements tied to it. Right. Interesting. And the follow up question here: Unlike M and A, CVC investing means that you buy a minority stake. Tell me why this is not a bad, bad thing. And also, what can corporates do to ensure they have some measure of influence and slash or control? Got it. Um, yeah, so the, the minority bet is something that tends to be fairly infamiliar, let's say, or uncomfortable sometimes for corporates. They're, they're used to corporate Corp Dev and M&A, big moves. Um, but just circling back to what I was saying, the minority investment makes sense when the broader context is given, meaning we are engaging with very high risk assets. And the only way to do that well is to diversify, right? And in fact, let's learn a little bit about how private venture capital uh, professionals and groups do it really well. There's actually two levels of diversification to mitigate this, right? One is in the fund, right? So they raise a fund and they'll they'll make investments of maybe 30 different startups. You know, one third will succeed, two thirds will fail. The one third that does succeed will make up financially uh, for those that fail. But the second la layer is that they also raise funds every three years or so. And so the vintage of each fund is quite different. And so that's another layer of diversification. Not all funds will perform the same. And so, Corporate venture capital capabilities need to understand that dynamic and infuse a diversification approach, be it programmatic, continuing to build out their, their portfolio over time. Uh, it's really, really important. Otherwise, you have a high concentration, high risk assets. And I think common sense will tell you that's a recipe for disaster, right? So, so that's the answer to that. I think on the influence and control, influence is okay in a startup friendly way. Influence is okay when it comes across as being helpful to the startup, right? And this is totally fine. Uh, control is likely an issue. Uh, you know, 
coming to the ecosystem and saying, it's all about the corporate. This is what I want to do. This is what I want. And not having a lot of empathy or understanding of what the startup struggles are it is tends to be a problem. And there's a long history of corporates doing this. So it's a really important issue to understand. Uh, influence, okay. Control, try to resist because- <laughs> Would be too much, right? <laughs> Too much, yes. <laughs> and Sid, Question. you have built a CVC fund for Latin American companies. Uh, take us through, please, uh, the steps in building and operating a fund, please. Sure. Uh, and I should take the opportunity to try and build on some of the points that Brian himself mentioned, right? But I mean, typically you're talking about a five-step process that begins with really defining the objectives of the fund and the strategy that's meant to drive it after which you go ahead and think about the structuring, resourcing, and incentivizing of the entire structure to make sure that it runs absolutely in sync with those strategic objectives. And then looking through steps C, D, and E, it's about developing the investment pipeline aligned with the strategy you've developed, evaluating your targets, and then obviously at the end, executing your transactions and managing the portfolio. And just for the purposes of building on this, right? let me try and focus on steps A and B. When we talk about alignment of the fund objectives, it is to say that your long-term strategy needs to be inherently linked to how it is that you go ahead and define the objectives of the funds itself, right? And typically this can run in an exercise of actually going ahead and deciding what are the investment themes that I believe I actually want to have exposure to? Which are the areas in which I believe I will want to invest? Not only based on the momentum that I'm seeing, but also based on the thesis that I have with respect to where is it that I actually want to grow as part of my longer innovation roadmap. Now, once you have that defined, you can start to think about you know, multiple aspects of the operating model itself, right? Organization is hugely important uh, from the perspective of basically understanding what kinds of resources would you actually want within this particular structure? Who is it going to report to? What does the investment committee look like? You want to go ahead and design that entire organization to ensure that there's agility in execution but also responsibility and execution relative to the goals that have been defined. You want to think about your talent model. Brian touched upon this when he happened to mention something with respect to saying that venture capital and corporate venture capital are about apprenticeship. You want to make sure that this is not something that is exclusively driven by people who are on the inside of the organization, because while they may have that strategic view, they don't actually have the experience of going ahead and running a successful venture capital program. So you want to ensure that you bring in external talent, external energy that can really change minds and attitudes within the organization itself. That's not something to fear, in a sense. And lastly, you need to think about governance and incentives, right? By governance, I sort of mean, you know, how is it that the, the oversight of this uh, corporate venture capital fund is managed, number one? Do you have a straight line of sight to the CEO? C-suite sponsorship is a huge, important driver of success in corporate venture capital based on all of the work that we happen to have done in terms of surveys. And lastly, incentives as well, right? You need to make sure that you go ahead and responsibly, but also in a market-friendly way, link the compensation of your venture capital uh, sponsors, those who work within your CVC fund, uh, to the performance that they are meant to drive such that they are truly motivated to deliver the best for the corporation in the long term. Uh, so this is how we typically, Denise, see this breakout. Uh, in terms of how you could go ahead and stand up and operate a CVC unit. Um, excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Brian, the, you know, thinking about your own career, right? Uh, you know, you, you happen to have made, uh, you've been an entrepreneur, you've been a corporate venture capitalist. We mentioned at the beginning you were a management consultant for a time as well. You went back into corporate venture capital, right? And now at a Latin American company, Take us through to the extent that you can, you know, what exactly is it that you happen to be doing in your day-to-day -day job to go ahead and drive the long-term strategy of COPEC? And actually, perhaps if I may, for sure. reference, in just, you know, small overview of perhaps, you know, how COPEC's entire process came about even. Well, sure. Um, you know, for that, to do that well, let me introduce COPEC. Uh, so COPEC, we're, we're the COPEC fueling piece of COPEC and Prese. Uh, and so for those not familiar, think gas stations, convenience stores, energy services uh, throughout Spanish Latin, uh, dominant player. Uh, 
Uh, and so in a very interesting way, COPEX core hits three really broad and really interesting sectors, energy, mobility, and retail. And the three of them just happen to be undergoing some very rapid change. Uh, and, and so COPEC, uh, I think rightly said in 2019, hey, let's, let's examine uh, you know, our future growth strategy. Uh, and you know, it became clear at that point uh, that uh, the rate of change was, was high and accelerating. Um, and so the risk of, let's say, value erosion to COPEC, it, it wasn't you know, tomorrow or the next week or the next month or even the next year. Yeah, we're talking decades, but you know, transformation of big companies takes a while. And so there was pretty quick alignment uh, to say, let's, let's start doing something that transforms COPEC or makes COPEC future-proofed or future-relevant into these new markets uh, that are undergoing a, a lot of change. And the answer to that, the answer to the how question was, uh, let's do it through innovation. And the reason is because it's a lot of this change is driven by startups, startups in Latin America, startups in the U.S., startups in Europe coming to Latin America. And so what we did is we set up a, an innovation platform uh, and we really customized this to the objectives for COPEC. So again, going back to the earlier part of this discussion of saying we can engage in many different ways, but what is the right way for us? You know, we, we very systematically um, clarified what the objective was. Uh, and then we said, what are the right models? And where we landed was the is the wind platform. And just so people know, wind is, if you know the, the COPEC logo, it's, it's uh, the globe where you see the sky and the clouds. And wind is the chaotic force within that to drive change, right? And so um, a pretty good analogy of what we're aiming to do. Uh, and so we set up the wind platform that has two key capabilities. One is wind ventures. That's the group that I head up. This is in San Francisco, where by far the most, the highest concentration of startups relevant to mobility, energy, and retail are. So that's strategically why we're in San Francisco. Uh, but we are out there scouting. Um, we're out there uh, interacting. We're out there you know, selling our value proposition. Uh, and then ultimately, we want to make call it four to six new investments per year uh, that have strategic alignment with some new growth area or, or, or addresses a key gap uh, in technology or knowledge or talent that we've identified. So that's a... And then the second group is called the Wind Garage. This is down in Santiago. This is a, a group of uh, former entrepreneurs uh, from the outside, but also COPEC engineers. Uh, and they get to think about the future of COPEC every day. So a little bit like a startup studio, you know, they get to launch their own businesses and do some experiments, uh, but also they're the partnering team. And this is you know, how we are making our value proposition real. So it, we think it's you know, the unfair access to Latin America is compelling. We think it's distinctive. Not many others have that value proposition to founders. But the way we make it real is through that dedicated team on the ground in Latin America to work well with startups. Um, and, uh, and so you know, fast forward to today. So that was in late 2019 and early 20. I built the team out in San Francisco. Uh, we did four new investments last year. We'll try to do six this year. Um, we did three, two or three in 2019. And, you know, I'll point to just as the last example of the model, and it seems to be working very well. You know, we made an investment in a company called STEM, which is an energy storage company in Silicon Valley. We're literally bringing this company to Latin America through a joint venture, right? Uh, and uh, now the company is really off to the races. It's getting recapitalized um, as we speak. Uh, and that will simply accelerate momentum and growth into uh, Latin America through that JV, but also from the US and into Europe. And so it's really sort of a, a wonderful illustration of what we intended to do is coming true. We just want to do that many, many more times over and over. Got it. Very interesting. Thank you. One last question for you. You're an American who's worked in Latin America. You happen to be working for a Latin American corporation now. You've therefore seen the startup ecosystem over here, right? What are your thoughts and impressions about where the future is headed uh, for the Latin American startup ecosystem? Uh, I, I think it's 
it's uh, tremendously positive. Um, you know, I think the tee up here is very exciting. This is part of why I joined um, you know, Wind Ventures was was the tee up in the region. You know, you have a very it's a very large market, right? So I think it's two x the number of people that are in the United States. Um, you have uh, highly you know high degree of urbanization, actually higher than Europe. You have a very high uh, penetration of smartphones, so highly mobile, highly digital. Uh, but yet there's a lot of poor experiences across from energy, mobility, banking, uh, you know, at home. There's just a lot of touch points and a lot of friction that can be uh, improved through new technology uh, and, and what have you. So I think the tee up here is really profound, and I think we're seeing a very large uh, growth in the region. In fact, I think we're, you know, compared to much older innovation ecosystems around the world, we're already larger than the Middle East, right? And I think we'll ultimately grow to be larger than the UK. Um, you know, I, I think all the all the assets and trends are there to do that. Um, in terms of development, I think I think you know, there's there's quite a bit of early stage capital in the region. Um, what what we we will likely see over time is a continuation of the fill out of what we call the funding continuum, where there'll be more dedicated permanent growth capital to fuel the earlier ones as they scale. Um, sometimes an entrepreneur in region feels like they have to go to Silicon Valley, for example. Um, but I think it's a, a tremendously exciting uh, uh, place to be, and so uh, you know, we're having a lot of fun with it. Brilliant, and long may that continue. Thank you, Brian. Denise, I'll leave the floor to you to take us through Q&A. OK, we have a few questions here. So Brian, the first for you. Uh, Brian, you, you are representing a Latin American corporation in front of the US and European startup community. Has that posed challenges? How to overcome it? Has it posed challenges? Um, I think, you know, I think the, it, so what's important is that Yes, we're in we're in the U.S. and Copec is headquartered in you know Santiago, Chile. But I think the question is, have we put in the connective tissue to have adequate information sharing and collaboration with the internal teams? Because that is absolutely critical. Um, and I think the answer is yes. And I'll share you know one of the KPIs that we follow is how many internal meetings do we have about a startup or with a startup. And just know my team is three people. So I have a very small team. But in last year, where the team was brought on in April, you know, we did over 200 meetings with internal teams. And so you can see where we spend a tremendous amount of time. And we're do, we do equal the amount of engagement externally with startups. And so we're making it work. And, and actually, we're having a lot of fun at it. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, another question: What should we? What should one absolutely not to do? Not do when designing and building a CVC? What you should definitely not do. Well, I think there's a couple elements that are really important. One is the right talent, and then secondly is the right resourcing. Right. So, when I personally, when I hear of a new CVC that's fifty million dollars. Um, for the fund, not per year, but for the fund. So meant to be invested over the first three to five years. You've got to question you know, the strategy behind that. Is that enough? Uh, is this really small investments or are you going to do really early stage? And I think both of those um, tend to be minority strategies for good reasons for corporates who tend to invest larger and later. Um, and so I think, you know, Resourcing or not resourcing it appropriately is a is a common and big mistake. And secondly, not hiring the right people. You know, Sid hit on that a little bit. You know, if you're missing those who have actually learned the venture capital pro process from that on, from that apprenticeship model that we both spoke about, if you're not including those on the team, uh, you are lacking familiarity with the model itself, and you're bound to make mistakes. See the question for you. When do you distinguish between an owned slash managed fund versus a CVC as a service? Under which circumstances should each model uh, be considered? 
so just to sort of actually go ahead and lay out the differentiation, right? So I mean, an owned fund is basically where you take a conscious decision to go ahead and put your own capital up as a corporate sponsor into a separate LP allocation and use that to go ahead and make your investments. You could alternatively do this off of your own corporate balance sheet, but the idea is the fact that you assemble the team right, in the way that COPEC happens to have done so, and you go ahead and make the investments through that particular team. You do also have an alternative model called corporate venture capital as a service, where there are essentially companies that go ahead and pool capital from sponsors for the purposes of giving them access to deals, which is why we call it corporate venture capital as a service, right? They're basically sort of like doing the job for you. I think the, from an executional perspective, just sort of trying to delineate the differences, one could argue that there is a greater amount of resource intensity that is associated with actually going ahead and putting together your own fund structure, right? Uh, and it also takes slightly longer for you to go ahead and get the entire operation stood up, versus in the corporate venture capital as a service model, you're effectively plugging into a ready machine, right, by just providing the capital. I guess the trade-off on the other side versus the ease question is really the linkage and the quality of learnings that you actually have relative to your strategic objectives. Because when you actually happen to have your own soldiers out in the trenches on a day-to-day -day basis, prospecting startups, organizing the kinds of meetings that Brian mentioned occur between uh, the startup, the CVC, as well as the corporation itself, you actually have access to a much richer set of learnings, right? Versus a corporate venture capital as a service model, which in a sense by comparison, depending on how it is designed and done, does have the chance to actually be a bit more distant, right? And a bit sort of disconnected from exactly the explicit choices that you would make if you happen to be in the driver's seat yourself. So typically, this is how we sort of see the differentiation, right? There's an inherent tension between, let us say, Denise, you know, sort of conversion and quality of alignment to your strategic goals on the one hand, and then on the other hand, sort of like the overall resource intensity and the effort required to go ahead and run out that entire operation, let us say. We have one more question for you, Sid. Do you know any case of a multi-corporate VC where companies with similar investment thesis join effort into a single fund? Is this model effective? I do, I do know of one, actually. There is a consortium of utilities out of Europe that have actually gone ahead and bound together uh, in order to go ahead and actually, um, let us say, pool their capital together to go ahead and drive an investment program around a single, a single set of teams associated with the energy transition, right? Um, I think, you know, success in corporate venture capital, you know, does sort of like require a slightly longer look back period, right? Uh, I think, you know, referring to this particular example, I would argue that so far, uh, you know, they have been able to achieve a good amount of momentum with respect to their investments. So you would sort of call that one marker of success. I guess the question that I have is that, to what extent can you actually find yourself in a situation where you as a single corporation are actually losing access to privileged insights, right? And that for me is key, is that everyone who happens to be playing in the same competitive landscape, you kind of lose the ability in a sense to actually have access to specific information that you can use tailored to your own strategy, right? Or even have access to proprietary technology, ideas, products, services that a particular startup happens to have. So again, I think it's a question of basically where you draw the line with respect to control, right? If you had the kind of model that COPEC, for instance, happens to have in the way that Brian described it, where you want to link ideas on the outside to internal business building, I suspect being part of a multi-corporate VC or CVC system is not as advantageous. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Brian and Sid, for today's conversation and to the participants who have contributed with questions to this session. We appreciate you having the, taken the time to be with us today. So thank you again, Brian and Sid. And uh, excuse me, but I'm going to switch to Portuguese for the last words of our meeting here. Okay. So próxima sessão, excepcionalmente, vai ser no dia 26 de fevereiro, ao meio-dia e meia, até... Uma e 15, o nome da sessão será Ecosistemas B2B, repensando o modelo para pequenas empresas. A entrevista vai ser com Miklos Dietz, que é o sócio sênior da McKinsey em Vancouver. E a participação na sessão de sexta-feira vai ser do Eduardo Arnone e do Gustavo Tayar, que são sócios da McKinsey 
em São Paulo, especialistas em meios de pagamento. Para conhecer a agenda completa do Maquin Stocks, acesse maquinstocks.com. Lá vocês podem assistir aos episódios anteriores e nos próximos dias esse episódio de hoje também vai estar disponível para vocês lá. E para quem curte podcast, esse áudio também vai estar disponível no Spotify. É só acessar lá que vocês encontram facilmente. Então, thank you, obrigada, até sexta-feira e uma ótima semana.